Hello everybody, welcome to episode 30 of Rebreak Radio. My name is Dennis and today I am joined by Mike. Hey. Uh, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. It's a little early in the US, but uh, doing doing well. It's been a, an interesting uh, few weeks. How have you been? Yeah, I, I, I've been doing great. I've been working. Just a lot of physical labor. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sometimes that's good to have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a two and one for working out and working. Yeah, exactly. Like I, I take my bike to work, so I get like, you know, I um, I get like all the exercise that I need without having to worry about it, which is great. Yeah. Um. But yeah, this episode is not about my work, my job, or exercising. This is like. A, a huge just rumor mill <laughs> of Nintendo <laughs> stuff. Like it's all just a bunch of Nintendo rumors and the Switch Online and just speculation about like what is going to replace Virtual Console and stuff like that. So, but we're gonna f- uh, start off with Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Pokemon Let's Go Eevee. The rumored titles for the new Pokemon games. Um, that will be coming to Nintendo Switch. So the rumors are that um, it will be, be coming out for the Switch. To, uh, and there was also a leaked screenshot like a long time ago uh, that was kind of debunked at a time, but has recently been brought back up. Um, and that kind of makes it look like, yes, this is kind of sun and moon in HD. Uh, in terms of like its graphical style, um, and yeah, it's go. It's called Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee, and yeah, Pikachu and Eevee will obviously be like the mascots of the game. It's set in Kanto, and um, uh, it's apparently going to have some integration with Pokemon Go. Catching Pokemon is going to work like in Pokemon Go, and um, yeah all that so what were your like initial reactions to let's go pikachu and let's go eevee well my first initial reaction was if they were just going to be doing a remake of the original pokemon games in kanto that uh you might recall i previously told you that i Mm. am a super nerd for or just like you know a super fanboy for pokemon and that i'd probably be willing to buy the switch because my past buying habits showed that i bought a 3ds just to be able to play sun and moon Mm. um like that i was going to buy this but if it's just a remake i'm probably not going to buy it but uh i guess i'm a little bit reassured by the fact that uh, among these rumors people are saying that it's just going to be a rehash or not not a rehash but like a a retelling of a different pokemon story in the old setting in the Mm. same way that like you and i were talking about earlier about uh red being in pokemon sun and moon and like showing an older version Mm. and that might be kind of leading to where they're going so my initial reaction is, please, Nintendo, don't screw this up. But, uh, you know, I'm kind of reassured by how well the Switch has been going. Uh, but, you know, they could always pull a Labo and do something that no one expects. So at this point, I'm kind of tentatively waiting. And that's part of the reason why I still haven't bought a Switch, because they need to have a, a new mainstay uh, in the Pokemon series. And I guess from the original uh, conversations that were happening a year ago, they were saying that they were making a new... Uh, like a new installment that was going to be a mainstay in the Pokemon series. So I'm hopeful, but Mm. again, these are all rumors. There's nothing that's like really well grounded and hopefully we'll find out come E3 uh, what the plan is for Pokemon. Yeah. As it's uh, one of the uh, points in in the leak is that it's supposed to be, and the, the guy or the person who wrote it says, says it's a remake of Pokemon yellow. And I do think that is a, I, I I believe it's like a gross simplification of what it actually is. Like as we talked about beforehand, I do very much think it is going to be uh just uh set in Kanto and it's not necessarily a remake of Yellow. Uh but as we see like with it's being called like Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee, I do think it's going to have a lot of uh parallels with pokemon yellow yeah. like how are you gonna surprised. have like a partner pokemon that follows you around 
Yeah, and I wouldn't be surprised if it has a lot of heavy integration with Pokemon Go as well, because Nintendo has showed at the very least that they want to cater towards their mobile uh, fan base. And by mobile, I mean people that mm-hmm. want to game on the go. Um, and they've done some forays into that with, you know, uh, Mario Run and all that. So, like, I wouldn't be surprised with that, especially because, you know, they've had such a good partner in Niantic. Um, so it, it's it's a distinct possibility. But yeah, I'd be really upset if they just decided to phone it in and just do a remake. But it would be yeah. cool to see a retelling of a Pokemon story for the next generation of, you know, wide eyed, enthusiastic kids, uh, yeah. the same way like you and I were back when the originals came out. Yeah. So um, something that's uh, important to note, um, Pokemon is not developed by Nintendo. Um, it's done by Game Freak, which works under the Pokemon company, which is partly owned by Nintendo. So the Pokemon company makes a l- or no, it's actually more like Pokemon company is its own entity. Nintendo is its own entity, and they both own parts of Game Freak. Yeah, that's how it works. So, uh, how, how you like you were saying, like Nintendo is working with Niantic. That's not really true. It's more like Pokemon Company is working with Niantic. Yeah, but if that, that's kind of like that's a workaround. It's 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 essentially the same thing because doesn't uh, Pokemon Company they're owned by Nintendo, right? No, I think their only their only relation is the fact that they both own Game Freak and Nintendo has like partial ownership of the pokemon ip okay well yeah i mean i don't think it's a stretch to say that they work with niantic i mean to one cap one capacity or another they have a professional relationship with them that Mm. has been shown to have been pretty fruitful based off of how um how popular and expansive pokemon go was when it first launched so you know there's a working relationship there and i think that's something that is probably going to be important in the future because if they release a new pokemon game uh, on the Switch, they would have to have some level of integration or else they'd cannibalize Pokemon Go's user base, I, I, I'd imagine, right? Yeah, possibly. But I, I do, like, I either think it's more like Game Freak or Pokemon Company is working with Niantic. Anyway, it's not the important topic here. Um, so, yeah, like... What I very much think this game this game is going to be is like when you look at as we talked about beforehand, like um when you went back to Kanto in gold and silver, spoilers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um you got to see like uh, a version of Kanto that has grown up. Like it's take takes place like a couple of years later or something like that. And like some some gyms have new gym leaders like the the elite four has like a new champion and stuff like that right yeah um st- things have changed and like like the pokemon tower in lavender town is now a radio tower like there are things that have changed throughout the world and i love i always love that like when you look for example in super mario galaxy 2 they had um a recreation of um, uh, Thwomp's uh, Fortress from Super Mario 64. And it's basically the same level, but it takes place after the events of 64. So, like, uh, have you played 64, Super Mario 64? Yeah, no, that was... uh, I I haven't played uh, basically anything Mm. past the GameCube era uh, in any sort of mainstay. Yeah. titles anywhere for nintendo but yeah no i played uh super mario 64 on the n64 that was that was a seminal title for me you know how there are like some secret stars in those walls that you can use the cannon to shoot mario to break yeah those walls are gone in this in the in the galaxy 2 version so it is literally made in a way like yeah this the events of 64 happen and this is like a, a like it this is the same world, but it takes place later. And I lo- always love that aspect of, of video games where like, you go back to a previous area and you can see how things have changed. Um, yeah, and I think you could trust Nintendo to do justice to any sort of game that comes later in an iteration, uh, er- iteration in a game's franchise because they actually do a really good job playing with time. And I don't think anyone needs to point anywhere further than Majora's Mask, which was at the time one of the most mind-bogglingly 
odd but also beautiful games because it just played against time so well. And you could even point to, you know, uh, original um, Ocarina of Time because you literally play with time and jump forward and backwards, but not so much as using it as a mechanic as much as it was used as a plot device. But yeah, I trust Nintendo to do something interesting with time. And I would be very interested to see their retelling of Kanto in a new Pokemon game. So mm. I don't know. I'm hopefully optimistic. We'll see where it goes. Yeah. Um, see, I do think this will be... Yeah, I don't know how long time after... Um, like uh, Bread and Blue and Gold and Silver that Sun and Moon takes place. But I would imagine, considering like the age of Red and Blue in Sun and Moon, I would imagine it's about like 10 years later or something like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, we'll see. I mean, this is this is just a crazy, not founded in anything, but like yeah. just while we're talking rumors, I think it'd be really cool to see like if, uh, you know, it's in the future where Professor Oak is no longer like the professor, but if it's Ash or if Red is a gym leader or if something mm. like that, like that would be kind of cool to see as just kind of like a, a nod to the fan service out there. But I don't know if they'd ever deviate that far off the path. Mm. Yeah. Um, like, yeah, I don't actually don't think we, but yeah, in, in Sun and Moon, uh, at the end of Sun and Moon, uh, Lily travels to Kanto. So there has definitely been teases from Game Freak that the next game will take place in Kanto, right? I guess. Uh, and also just that. the fact that Sun and Moon has Alolan forms of a bunch of Kanto Pokemon. And apparently in Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, um, you're like uh, the Rotom that you have like as you're in your Pokedex, like as your companion throughout the game. He says that you know that Kanto isn't that far away from, or you know that Alola isn't that far away from Kanto, right? And so they're making a lot, a lot of references to the fact that Kanto is something that they, like, it, Kanto is important. Um, and yeah, as in, in the end game, you get to meet Red and Blue from the original um, Red and Blue Pokemon games, obviously. And they're now, like, grown up and they're older and um and i would very much imagine that this new remake or this new like return to kanto will in will be like a sequel to sun and moon and will include lily will probably be a part of the story um you will meet grown-up versions of red and blue and you'll go through the gym, le the gyms in Kanto, and maybe not all of them have the same gym leaders anymore. And uh, you know, the ones they do, like they're older, and maybe they have different sets of Pokemon, and like because ever since since the, like those games, like a lot of those Pokemon Pokemon's have received the new evolutions, like. Maybe, for example, like um, Brock, for instance, like he has an Onyx. Like, what if Brock's Onyx is now a Steelix, for instance? You know, like yeah. uh, there are so many, uh, or like maybe uh, Lieutenant Surge has like an Elective Ire or something from um, from Generation Four. Like there are, so, or maybe some of them have Mega Stones and C Rings. You know, like there are so many different things that they could do. Yeah, or um, even uh, because, like, technically, I mean, if they wanted to be, like, super accurate to the date, it's been uh, about 20 years since the originals came out. So it'd be cool if they even furthered the story by saying, like, you know, Lieutenant Surge got married or whatever, like, the new gym leader is actually his daughter or something like yeah, that. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's so many services they could do in that game and uh, pass it along for the next generation. So, again, wishful thinking, but, yeah. like, there's so many cool things that I would like to see. And I think some people have talked about like the top 10 things that they wanted to see mm. in, uh, in the new Pokemon game. And I think the fan services are definitely going to be a component, but in a fresh way that doesn't feel like they're just, you know, berating us over the head. Yeah. And like, there are like uh, game freak has played a lot with continuity when it comes to Pokemon. Like there are always, like you always get to see characters from other games show up, even if they're just cameos, like, this happens all the time in the Pokemon games. Like yeah. uh, Cynthia, for instance, from Diamond and Pearl, like I think she shows up in Black and White and, and in Sun and Moon. Um, so they've always loved to play with continuity and 
all that stuff. So I do think it's very likely that this will be kind of the game that wraps up all the seven generations into one package. But uh, there were another rumor, and this is one that very much makes me worried about this project. Um, and that is that apparently only the original 151 will show up in Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee. Yeah, well, that might kind of be heralding to their uh, involvement with Niantic, because as you know, like when Pokemon Go came out, they didn't have every single Pokemon in the entire collection. They just had the original ones and slowly mm. added on to it. And it'd be interesting to see if there is any sort of uh, connection with uh, Nintendo's online uh, capabilities and um, like the Nintendo Switch's online features and if they slowly release new Pokemon. I don't know if that's possible, but then again, knowing Nintendo, like we were talking about earlier, there's no way we can predict if that would be the case, mm. but if they create a Pokemon game that they try to release as like a like a long-term service in the same way that like Overwatch is, um, you can maybe anticipate that, but if it's the first original ones, again, like that seems to be a rehash. Like if they're telling a new story or introducing a new mechanic, that'd be great. And if they're trying to like refresh the entire universe, that might make sense. Because one of the biggest complaints I often hear from people that aren't really big into Pokemon, they're like, there's just too many, too many freaking Pokemon. Like it's kind of hard to keep up with all mm -hmm. of them. Um, so, you know, it'd be interesting to see if they have some sort of mechanic to spin on that. But I don't know if that would be a complete turnoff for me. It might be for you. Yeah. Uh, but my favorite generation is generation four. So like if this was limited to generation one, like I, that would be a major turnoff for me. I would probably still get it, but like, I, I don't like the idea of that. But what I, what I think this is about is, again, like how the original leak said, like, oh, it's a remake of Yellow, right? I do think it is more of a... Uh, obviously, as rumors and leaks always are, like, they're not always entirely accurate. And I think this is the case as well. I do think this will be more of a black and white situation. Did you play uh, black and white? Uh, not really. Uh, so, like, there's some gaps in my... Um... Mm -hmm in my in my play so black and white's one of them and then uh diamond and uh pearl are also kind of uh like i played a little bit of diamond but mm -hmm. i never finished it yeah so what happened in in black and white is that was basically like a soft reboot of pokemon in some ways um how that was the the that region had only new pokemon it had only pokemon from generation five um it ha they had like a, a 150 entirely new pokemon and all the other pokemon did not show up until the end game and i think this will be a very similar situation where uh, obviously kanto the pokemon in kanto are the original 151 right so yeah. i do think this will be the situation where you are in Kanto, and these are the Pokemon that live in Kanto. Uh, and while they, I, I could definitely see them expand that to the new evolutions that the game that those Pokemon's have received since. I do think, like when it comes to entirely new Pokemon, they will not show up until the end game, and that yeah. I would be a lot more okay with, because yeah, it makes my sense, right? Yeah, no, it totally makes sense. And again, like, until there's something more definitive, I don't want to, like, I don't, it's it's more like I don't want to get myself too hyped up for something because I don't want to be let down. And I think Nintendo has a sterling track record for letting people down. Mm -hmm. Um, Or, you know, take that with however way you mm -hmm. want. But it'd be, it'd be interesting to see, like, where that goes. And uh, I think there's obviously, like you were just saying, uh, there's kind of a track record for them doing that where they introduce like a totally new uh, concept idea or Pokemon and then for Endgame they reintroduce it and I think Gold and Silver was a great example because then you know as an easter egg they unlock the entire Kanto region after you finish the main game and then mm. you can just redo all of Red, Blue, and Yellow uh, after uh, Gold and Silver were done. Mm. Um, so they have that uh, and they've always had a penchant for having you revisit old regions after the main game of another installment of Pokemon is finished. So, like, like we were saying earlier, you know, uh, the one thing you could always count on Nintendo is to be unpredictable or predictably mm -hmm. unpredictable. So, like, 
I don't know if we should count on them to do uh, a similar thing that they've done in the past, but I think that might be the safest bet. So uh, I, I pr it's probably, if the rumors are true, that's, that's what I'd be expecting as well. So <clears throat> when it comes to what is what I think is very interesting with when it comes to Game Freak specifically, the developers of Pokemon, is that they are a part of Nintendo that is like as as I did say, like Nintendo is predictably unpredictable, but Game Freak is very predictable. They are probably the most predictable part of Nintendo that you can find. Because what have they done since Especially like when it comes to Pokemon, what have they done since Red and Blue? They have made Pokemon only games. Done Pokemon, right? They've only ever done Pokemon. They they have uh, since they're not like entirely owned by Nintendo. They can do things on other platforms, and they have made games on other platforms. Um, but like in when it comes to, like strictly to Pokemon, they haven't done anything but just iterating on the same concept for twenty years, right? Yeah. And that is why like when we when we look at the rumors for this new Pokemon game, why it's so believable is because it's so predictable. And like when you read sure. all these things, like you can see things in Game Freak's history to allow you to fill in the blanks. And like I like uh, how I said like okay, yeah, it's a remake of Yellow. Well, not nah, probably not really. It would probably be more of a more of a like a gold and silver situation, like how you go back to Kanto and it's a new Kanto and all that. And uh, ru the rumor is one the original one fifty one. Well, not really. The other ones will probably show up in the end game because that's what they always do, because they are extremely dedicated to their hardcore fan base. Um, how when it comes to competitive Pokemon, like. I think Game Freak is very scared of upsetting competitive Pokemon. And that's why they have their vision of the game, but then in the end game, they open it up. Because that allows this iteration of Pokemon to become the vessel for competitive Pokemon, right? It doesn't matter yeah. what the content of this game is, but all the Pokemon are there, all everything, all the tools you need. For competitive pokemon is here after you finish the game yeah so actually kind of going off of that and then and you saying like they're predictable uh my question for you is uh in terms of like the art style for the game are you expecting anything or are you expecting them to have like a very similar art style to what they had in like ultra sun and ultra moon um or do you think that they're going to have like a graphics overhaul in the same way that we saw it with like um the new legend of zelda breath of the wild like, are you anticipating that they're going to have like a completely new art style for the game or that they're going to add some complete new mechanic and that's why they're doing the restart or like not necessarily a restart, but why rumors are saying they're only going to have the first 151 mm. Pokemon to reintroduce them for with a new game mechanic? Or do you think it's just going to be like, you know, kind of the same cadence that they've been running to for the last, you know, two or three cycles? So I, I do think, especially like uh, from that screen, have you seen the screenshot that was leaked like, few months ago yeah uh yeah so it's basically a trainer sitting on a lapras in an environment that looks a lot like sun and moon and on his head is an eevee and like everyone's like oh this is just like someone who made like this like back when it came out everyone's like oh this is just sun and moon running in the citra emulator or something like that but since then like when, especially when you see that Eevee on his head, like, oh man, this is probably real. Um, so yeah, I think it, it is probably real. It is probably just the the art style, of, probably even just the engine of Sun and Moon reworked for Switch, running in 1080p. Um, because I think what happened this this is probably like they made X and Y, and. Because what always happens with, with Game Freak is that they stay on an old platform for a very long time before jumping. And what ha uh, so, like, if you look at um, DS, like, they made Diamond and Pearl early on in, in, uh, in DS's generation, and then they made Black and White, and Black and White 2 came out after the 3DS had even launched. 
Um, and then they made X and Y on on a 3DS, which came out, I think, two or three years after the 3DS even launched. And that like that's a pretty long time. And then they made Sun and Moon, which came out two years ago, and Ultra Sun and Moon came out last year after the Switch came. No, uh, like just before the Switch came out. No, yeah. no, after the Switch came out. Yeah, the Switch yeah. came out early 2017, and that came out in 2017. Yeah. Well, the only reason I kind of bring that up is because I remember having read probably a year ago that uh, some of the heads at Game Freak were saying that. Um, like the last uh, Pokemon game that they had on the 3DS would be the very last installment on the yes. uh, con- or on that um, specific platform because they had already worked as much as they could out of the hardware mm-hmm. of it and they didn't think that it was possible that they could work anything more out of it. So I'm kind of anticipating, I guess my hot take to take away from this is uh, I'm fully anticipating the next Pokemon game to be a fully 3D realized Pokemon game in the same way and same art style similar to that of what we saw in Breath of the Wild, because I don't think that it, I mean, it's, it wouldn't be a surprise so, to me that they do a full 3D game on the Switch with the new hardware, and like, it's not leaps and bounds better than the 3DS, but I think that Game Freak is going to take the most out of that hardware and really push it, because they're really good at pushing the boundaries on uh, hardware limitations, especially so, because Nintendo is so limited. I think you should definitely take that back uh, immediately, because we're not seeing that until the next Pokemon game. Uh, until the proper generation eight, I believe. So what uh, um, what I was gonna finish off by saying is that considering um, Game Freak has taken a long time, they took a long time to do uh, X and Y on the 3DS generation, and they uh, they've always been like they've never been at launch really when it comes to Pokemon, and that is yep. because I think they take their time to master the system before releasing a game. Um, and what happened, what I think happened here is um, either uh, either like Pokemon Company or Nintendo or someone outside of Game Freak has pushed Game Freak to make, to immediately jump to Switch. And because like last, like we're talking about two years, like that is not enough time to create an entirely reimagined version of pokemon that is not enough time to create the breath of the wild of pokemon and especially uh, since they probably had some like they probably uh, and uh, like what i i would imagine is that part of the poke of the game freak team worked on ultra sun and ultra moon and this post sun and moon obviously part of the game freak team worked on uh on ultra sun and ultra moon and I would also imagine that not entire the entire Game Freak team is working on, um, is working on this. Uh, let's go Pikachu. Let's go Eevee. I would imagine that the probably the major part of Game Freak is working on Generation Eight. They're working on that Breath of the Wild, um, reimagining of Pokemon because uh, Game Freak has all. There was a rumor last year that uh, when Game Freak announced. Uh, their Switch game, Pokemon Switch game, that was originally just going to be like a regular Pokemon game. But since then, they saw the the critical success of Super Mario Odyssey and Breath of the Wild. And since then, like the rumor is that, oh, this time they're going to reimagine Pokemon. But it's so far away that we need something in between. So that is Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee. Um... See, I'm not sure if I completely buy into that, especially because I think, like, again, going back to what you said, they're predictably unpredictable in the sense that Nintendo, you know, needs to, like, they're always trying to do something different. And I think, uh, based off of this, their one-two punch when the Switch first came out was Breath of the Wild and a new fresh installment in the Mario franchise. And I think that their next one-two punch to make sure that the sales of the Switch continuously grow is going to be obviously one Super Smash Bros. And because they don't want, they want to make sure that those two games, um, Smash and Pokemon, do not run into each other again. So my two predictions I would say to take away from this is one, it's going to be a fully realized 3D Pokemon game. Two, I'm not anticipating seeing this uh, Pokemon game until spring or early summer of 2019. I don't think Pokemon is going to be coming out in 2018, especially because they're probably not going to want it to bump up into Smash Bros. So 
I think with that added time, they're going to have more than enough time, or at least Game Freak's going to have more than enough time to fully realize this game in 3D. But also, the other games that they had been working on at least two years ago were really just rehashes of old ideas because they were just doing the ultra versions of games they had already done. And if you look at the timeline between um, like when they started kind of doing that faux 3D uh, on the 3DS, it was probably about a three-year period between uh, that and I think the, the one before that was um, uh, Pearl and Diamond. And I think it was like a two to three year period between then. So like they can definitely do a fully like new hashed, new idea game. Um, and I think that they've had, I, again, from the developer standpoint, they've had, uh, they probably have had access to the physical hardware of the Switch well before the Switch launch. I would imagine probably um, seven to nine months before uh, it was launched itself. So they've probably had ample time to work with the hardware itself. Um, and I, I wouldn't put it past them, uh, especially because, you know, like you said, um, you know, this is kind of all that they work on and all that they iterate on. So I, I think they have a very good grasp of what they can do and uh, what I think their fans expect in a way that like they the, the what they were doing on the 3DS and all that. They, they kind of ran it into the ground with um, in terms of what their hardware can do. And I think that they want to experiment with new mechanics and new systems. And I think they're probably going to push the graphical intensity of the game and that's what i'm kind of hoping for but when do you think uh like what's your timetable for this pokemon game potentially coming out so i think this is definitely i like um i actually <laughs> entirely disagree with you um all right because <laughs> as as i said um i think this is their um because this game is not anything like this is unlike everything game freak is doing this is so out of their um like pattern that i do think this game exists only because someone higher up said that this game needs to exist we need something on switch and i do think it's nintendo i do think nintendo is saying like hey we need a pokemon game as soon as fucking possible on the switch right um and because usually they have like Game Freak, they operate on the uh, on their own. Like Game Freak and Pokemon Company, they operate on their own to the beat of their own drum, right? Because yeah. uh, it, we, like we've seen as many times uh, before this, like Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon was announced like two weeks before E3. Uh, Sun and Moon was announced in like February of 2016. Uh, they don't announce things at Nintendo's uh, press conferences. The only and the fact that we heard about this new Pokemon game at uh, Nintendo's E3 press conference last year, that tells everything to me that this game only exists because Nintendo wants this to exist. Nintendo is probably paying up the ass for this game to exist and for them to like rush this game out basically like they probably uh put and and because if if nintendo doesn't didn't care this much about pokemon coming out so soon on switch we would not see pokemon until probably 2019 or 2020 um and that then it would be this graphically impressive um new iteration generation 8 of pokemon but this is not part of any generation which is unlike anything um, a Game Freak has ever done. Um, and the fact that it has such a different title and all of this stuff, like th that tells everything to me. Um, yeah, well, I think, so I'm just going to respectfully disagree with you on the fact that I don't think Nintendo is rushing this game at all because just looking, again, and I'm not as big into the Nintendo ecosystem anymore as I used to be, and I know you definitely are more so than I am, Anytime I look at what Nintendo does, it never feels like anything that they're doing is necessarily rushed. Like they definitely take their time. Yeah. And if uh, you were to take that like train of thought to the next level of them rushing something just because their fans want it, then at this point we would have um, virtual console and we would have all of these things. But I think for certain things, they know that they require respect and time and need to be done correctly. And that's why they took forever to make a new Legend of Zelda game. That's why they usually take a decent chunk of change between uh, installments or, you know, mainstay installments in the Mario franchises. So mm. I don't 
like maybe you and I are looking at it from completely different perspectives, but like, you know, maybe we should make a bet about this come, you know, after E3. But I, I think, you know, the two things that I'm betting on is one, it's going to be in 2019 and two, it's going to be a fully realized 3D game. And I think just them being Nintendo, you could expect them to do something different. And I don't anticipate them doing the same formulaic thing that they've done for the last two, three generations of Pokemon games. Yeah, uh, that's but that's the thing, right? Like Nintendo uh, or uh, I was actually going to mention this first. So uh, if you look deeply into Nintendo's library, there are two kinds of Nintendo games. There are the masterpieces and the trash. <laughs> and if you look at the masterpieces, those games are Breath of the Wild, Odyssey, uh, Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze, um, like all these amazing, amazing, amazing games. Then you look at the trash. There you have Hey Pikmin. You have uh, Shibi Robo Ziplash. You have Star Fox Zero. You have um, you have all these games that. They exist because they need to exist. They exist because Nintendo needs to fill a quota of games every year. Um, uh, and th I think this game is part of that list. I don't think it's going to be a bad game like a lot of the trash games are. But I do think this game exists because they want the Nintendo game out. They want a Pokemon game out now. Um... But yeah, I'm totally willing to bet. Um, I do very much think that this game will be um, like basically um, like a repurposed uh, Sun and Moon technology for Switch. Uh, it will and uh, it will come out this year, and we will see the proper next generation pokemon game come out in a year or two after this game hmm. i think that they're gonna have to do something to impress especially because it seems like people you know including the guys that kind of funny think that uh, sales for the switch are kind of stagnating because there's nothing game wise that's really pushing it hmm. um and then also you know not to just keep harking on these points but you said that uh like there's a there's the masterpiece Nintendo games and then the trash games. Mm. Uh, I I agree that there's you know there's masterpieces and there's trash games, but I don't think that those trash games exist because they're just trying to shovel out content to fill the void. I think it's that Nintendo is constantly and somewhat detrimentally innovative, and they're always trying to do something different and something new. And they sometimes have taken chances with franchises, but the two franchises that they never take any chances with is the Mario franchise and the Pokemon franchise. Every other franchise can basically, you know, have a on year off year, but those two franchises are the ones that they continuously say, you know, these need to be, you know, the best. But unfortunately, Pokemon has kind of been stranded in the land of handheld uh, Nintendo consoles, which traditionally haven't really done anything uh, huge, uh, minus the uh, the original DS. So, um, I don't know. I think I think you're under you're underselling it a little bit, or you're undervaluing it a little bit. And I think you should uh, you should trust <laughs> trust Game Freak to do right by uh. By yeah, this that franchise. that's that's the thing. Like, I'm not saying this is gonna be a bad game, but the thing oh, is, I this know, will be uh, because as I I said, like this is repurposed Sun and Moon technology. This will be just another Pokemon game. That is exactly why, and that will come with just another Pokemon game. What a just another Pokemon game is? It's a great game. And that is what just another Pokemon game is. But I do not think that we're getting this new revolutionary game that has been rumored so much because there has been rumors of them completely redesigning the, the battle system and all of this stuff. But I think this is coming with the next installment. This is coming with the proper Generation 8. All right. Well, that's, that's, that's fair. And uh, anyways, I'll be interested to see how my predictions compared to your predictions come after probably when they do a nintendo direct to announce this because i don't think they're going to do it at e3 but around e3 times so. no, uh the rumor the rumor is that they're going to announce let's go uh pikachu and let's go eevee before the end of may so yeah, yeah i should, heard that rumor too uh which is not surprising because um ultra sun and ultra moon was announced before the end of may and uh so yeah it is not uh surprising whatsoever i do very much believe that the so yeah, I should probably get this episode out as soon as possible because it's possible that uh, it, the game may have already been announced. Uh, yeah. 
make sure we break before the, that news breaks. So our, yep. our, uh, our hot takes <laughs> are, uh, they don't seem uh, too cold. <laughs> Um, but yeah, there are some other details that we haven't touched on yet, and something uh, specifically one thing that I have that I think has been incredibly overblown, and that is uh, one of the points in the rumor says that catching Pokemon is like Pokemon Go, and a lot of people have said that oh this means that they're ditching the battle system that or uh, like you just have to run into grass and then you just have to catch it no I do not think that is what it actually means what I do think this means is that literally the act of catching a Pokemon is like in Pokemon Go yeah I think it's going to be something similar to the sense of rather than like there's there's probably going to be some element of skill involved in catching pokemon in the same way that they have it in pokemon go yeah. like that you have to throw it in a general direction or whatever like i don't know how they could gamify the act of tossing a pokeball but i i, I guess i agree to an extent what that rumor was saying that there's going to be some sort of game mechanic involved with catching that in the same way that mm. you have it in pokemon go not necessarily the exact same mechanic but a mechanic similar to you know or just you know a mechanic that makes a gameplay element added to the fact of throwing a pokeball so i can kind of get mm -hmm. on board with it that that makes perfectly logical sense yeah because one of the things that like obviously like pokemon go is not really a good game like it's it's a good social experience yeah but mm -hmm. one of the things that people very much like um praised about pokemon go was the act of catching pokemon because it's fun to actually try to hit the pokemon with a pokeball and yeah. and I think that actually sparked the idea at Game Freak, like, oh, yeah, we should probably do that, too, because people really liked it. Um, so I do think, like, in handheld mode, you'll use the touchscreen in, in a very similar way to as it's done in, in Pokemon Go. But in uh, tabletop mode or in TV mode, you will use the Joy-Con to throw the Pokeball literally like you, how you would throw a Pokemon Pokeball in real life. And yeah. I can see it probably, like, um like you pick up a pokemon pokeball with like the tr you with the trigger and then you hold it and then you release the trigger when you want to throw the ball and in in like the arc of your throw and stuff like that yeah and so i can also you see an element pick up and throw something in a vr game yeah and i can also see an element of difficulty gradients being applied to like using a regular pokeball is going to be more difficult or like you know because it's a higher difficulty you'll have like i don't know might affect some sort of stat in the game of like um i don't know necessarily getting experience mm. uh for catching pokemon but like you know uh, a regular pokeball is gonna be more difficult to catch a pokemon with and then like great ball will be easier ultra ball will be easier um master ball will obviously be the easiest or you know impossible to mess up yeah but i can imagine that there's some sort of gradient system that they apply overlaid onto the pokeballs which would be a really interesting thing because i'm definitely looking to see them innovate on the kind of um quality of life features of that game to make it like more fun to play for end game purposes and i think that's one super easy win that they could definitely walk away with so i just started thinking about the master ball like what happens if you throw the master ball and you miss well i would imagine that the master ball itself being a idiot proof system would probably say oh well it's a master ball so it's to automatically get to catch whatever you're throwing it yeah. at so but the nature of the master ball is yeah. you don't want to waste it on something like you know from the original games the only way you can get multiple master balls is if you put it in your fifth inventory slot in your pc and surfed on the side of zanzibar i can't remember it was one of the yeah it was one of those you know janky ass cheats but like mm. you know there was a reason why you only got one master ball and yeah. people knew that you would be using it on a pokemon like mewtwo when you ran mm. into him in the cave uh north of cerulean city yeah god it's mm. been so long yeah. um but yeah so like you know West I'm sure Rays somebody will figure out a way to screw it up in the same way that you yeah. see YouTube videos of people saying like, you know, this is how you add a headphone jack to your iPhone and people fall for it and stupid, but you know, it could happen. That's actually true though. Like the, yeah. the guy actually added a headphone jack to the iPhone. I know, but that that's 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 a different thing. People were literally drilling into their phones and invalidating <laughs> their warranty, which, you know, yeah. if you're dumb, you know, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah. Um. But yeah, like I, I, I would imagine that the when you throw the master ball, like how, what, whatever direction you throw it in, it's gonna home in on the Pokemon. Uh. However yeah. you throw it. So yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> but it would be funny if you're like, oh my god, oh my god, I can't miss this one, can't miss this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Uh, then you fucking miss it. And then you look up and then it's just a rat yeah, that would be a viral, a viral worthy Vine, or not, uh, Vine's not around anymore, but that would be a viral worthy YouTube video or Twitter yeah. video, somebody just messing up royally on a Master Ball throw. Mm. That'd be great. Uh, but yeah, I do think that was pretty much it in terms of uh, Pokemon, Let's Go um, Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee. And yeah, that's 50 minutes. <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty sizable chunk. Like I said, that's that's where most of my passion is with the Pokemon stuff. So I could I could talk ad nauseum about that mm. stuff. But yeah, that was that was a pretty good uh, pretty good segment there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, now we're gonna talk uh, not as long as we're talking about Pokemon, but we're gonna talk about uh, Star Fox Grand Prix and Nintendo Switch Online and Virtual Console. And I do think Virtual Console will probably be a little bit meatier than the, the other the other two. So Star Fox Grand Prix is the next uh, is the rumored uh next rumored game from retro studios the creators of the metro prime trilogy and uh the don Kong country returns uh duo of games so returns and tropical freeze yeah um okay. do you want to talk more about that or do you want to give have me uh give my hot take on it yeah They're so um yeah basically it's it's rumored to be uh and a star it's like it's a star fox game that works like if you merged f-zero and diddy kong racing <laughs> mm-hmm. um so yeah that's uh that's basically that's basically all we know you know i think yeah well i'm not super uh like so my first takeaway from this and what i told you was i'm not really surprised by this considering that we haven't had a fully dedicated, like fully fledged racing game on the Switch other than the port of Mario Kart 8. So my fear would be that if they were to make a racing uh, Star Fox game or F-Zero game or any sort of racing game in the future, the fear would be that it would cannibalize uh, the sales and kind of the market that they have kind of cornered with the Mario Kart games. But since they didn't really develop a new one, it just ported Mario Kart 8 over, uh it seems more and more likely that this probably has some weight to it and i would expect that that's probably why because not that they want to retire mario kart but it seems like it's kind of getting stale like they haven't really innovated a ton other than adding you know maybe a few new maps here or there a different car here um so uh i i think this is probably a very reasonable rumor and uh, I'd imagine that the Star Fox Grand Prix is probably something that they announced to open with in the next Nintendo Direct. Like, I wouldn't be surprised by this at all. Mm. Yeah, um, the only thing that I'm just... or, Well, first of all, it's Retro Studios. Retro Studios is a very... is one of the best in the industry. But what I'm most... Like, if this is true, the, what I'm most like disappointed by is the fact that they're not making uh, a third Donkey Kong Country game. Like, I really would have wanted them to finish the, their Donkey Kong Country trilogy because I I love those games. Those are masterpieces of game design. And, um, yeah. Uh, but, like, um, it's it's retro. Like, whatever they make, it's going to be great. Um, so I do think this game will be great or whatever. And, yeah, if it... The other thing that I'm kind of sad about is that this isn't an F Zero game, <laughs> if especially if it's supposed to be like F Zero, uh, because I love F Zero, I love Captain Falcon, um, so yeah, I I'm kind of disappointed about that. But hey, like it's uh, the premise of the game sounds awesome. Like Star Fox has a lot of uh cool and colorful characters, um. And, uh, like, I love the game, like, if this is, like, the gameplay of, of F-Zero with this kind of campaign open world of Diddy Kong Racing, like, dude, I'm totally up for it. And the only thing I have to deal with is that we have Star Fox instead of Captain Falcon. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm totally up for that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, i totally excited for whatever this is, and yeah, we'll see. We're definitely seeing this at E3. If it's coming out this year, I don't know. I would imagine this is probably an early 2019 game. 
I think. Yeah, I don't really have a grasp on the timeline for this because, you know, to be completely honest, I'm not super well aware of Retro Studio and like their work because, again, I'm not deeply ingrained into the mm. Nintendo culture as much as you are, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if there was an announcement for this because it seems like they had been working uh, or there are rumors of them working on this for the last several years, so yeah. I can't imagine that their cycle would take more than five years. And also kind of going back to what you were saying, wishing that they had you know worked more on the uh, the Diddy Kong, Donkey Kong kind of universe. Uh, I know that a lot of developers are always afraid of becoming one trick ponies and only working on one game. Mm. And that's kind of what forced, you know, the hand of certain studios to move on to other titles like, you know, Bungie moving to destiny, you know, moving away from the halo series. Cause they didn't want to just be the one trick pony because there's definite developer fatigue that sets in when people mm. only work on one style of game yeah. or one franchise of games. So they always like to mix it up to make sure that if they ever do come back to another installment, of any sort of game in a franchise that they own, that it seems like a fresh take. And I think a great example of that is, and kind of pulling from different parts of the industry, uh, Bethesda Game Studios um, was kind of a one-trick pony with the Elder Scrolls, but once they got the rights to do Fallout, uh, Fallout 3, you could see, has a lot of carryover and has greatly affected uh, Skyrim because they pulled a lot of elements from mm -hmm. Fallout 3 into Skyrim, mm -hmm. and the two of them have been working kind of in tandem with each other and making uh, Bethesda Games better. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And they, they've definitely been that before because they're known for Metroid Prime. And that is mm -hmm. basically all that they, uh, like, whenever, it's like you can, <clears throat> uh, like, in all the stories about Star Fox Grand Prix, it's always like, Retro Studios, the makers of Metroid Prime, is rumored to make a Star Fox game. And, <laughs> and they're not, like, probably, like, ever mentioning Donkey Country Returns or Tropical Freeze, which I would say are even better games. Um, so I, I, I do think, like, they're... The, and when Metroid Prime 4 was announced, everyone's like, oh, Met Retro is doing Metroid Prime 4. And it's like, no, they're not doing that. It's an internal Nintendo team. Or what's actually... Uh, rumored to be now it's actually a uh, bandai namco uh singapore who's making it um yeah so uh yeah they're definitely they have been a victim of what you were talking about definitely with metroid prime um so but yeah i do i do think this is true and um i'm excited to see what it what it is Yep, same here. All right, so next up we have the Nintendo Switch uh, Online and related to that, the death of Virtual Console. So, yeah, this was a while ago by now, but yeah, they announced that, they announced the details of Nintendo Switch Online. And, I mean, you've probably heard it by now, like you get a bunch of games with... For uh, Nintendo, like a bunch of NES games, get to play online. Uh, you get cloud save uh, data backup, and um, there are a bunch of things with the online app. How you still have to do voice chat in it and special offers, blah blah blah, all that shit. Yeah. Uh, the new interesting information here is that yeah, they announced that it will have a cloud save uh, backup. But that there also will be a family membership um, for thirty four ninety nine, where up to eight family members can go under the same subscription, which is great, and that is yeah. just uh, perfect for like Nintendo is so family centric and yeah, like this is so so perfect uh, because I I like I think it was um, uh, Per Schneider at IGN. He talked about this on NVC back when it was in the, and he talked about how he needs to pay for um, like PlayStation Plus for every single one of his kids, including himself. So like that is a lot of money um, oh, yeah. for just playing online. So I, this is such a this is such like a, a good thing by Nintendo that um, like a family with like three kids and maybe the the one or two of the parents also play games like if you had to pay if like 60 bucks per person like that is a shit ton of money and yeah, yeah it's just 20 when it comes to nintendo but it's still a lot of money every every year um 
So yeah, this is such a great thing by Nintendo that up to eight family members can go on their one subscription, which is obviously more expensive than the individual membership, but still, it's cheaper than having um, eight subscriptions, right? Yeah, and I was going to say, like, that was actually one of the things that caught my eye the most about their pricing policy was the fact that they did have a family membership option, and, um, you know, there are definitely seminal moments of the gaming industry, like, um, you know, Xbox introducing, you know, gamer score and, uh, like, that then catching on like fire, but I think that this is a very very good step in the right direction for Nintendo and kind of leading the pack in terms of offering a family membership because um like like you said they're like you know with the with the labo they're very family oriented and they're definitely kind of targeting towards kids and using this can be also viewed in a very consumer friendly perspective you know especially with everything that happened with loot boxes kind of getting the mm. goodwill of the community uh and i think like that was probably the thing that was most interesting to me and for my friends that don't really play on Nintendo a lot if i could convince them to get on switch i might try to uh, finagle my way into getting into a family plan with like me and a few of my buddies. I think that'd be pretty funny. Yeah. But uh, it kind of reminds me though of um, on Steam. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but on Steam you could actually create uh, a family where you uh, like I, I have a family account with my two best friends and my girlfriend. So essentially, all the games that I have and I have over uh, God, I don't want to admit this, but like over 350 <laughs> games on Steam. Um, they can play all of my games and I can play all of their games that I don't have uh, in that library. So um, it's kind of similar to that, I guess, in a way, but uh, it's definitely, um, I'm really impressed by this on Nintendo. Mm. So something else that I thought was interesting here is that until this point, we did not have any official confirmation of there being actual uh, cloud backup of there being like a save data cloud backup system and like i <laughs> it would not surprise me if this feature was not originally planned and this came after they heard that everyone wanted it yeah i think this is the one clear-cut example of nintendo caving into consumer demand especially because um like achievement systems and uh, save backups and all that have been mainstays in their competitors for the last two generations. Mm. Uh, I think that this is them playing catch up. And I, I think like a lot of their games, they never really anticipated to ever need such functionality because of just the way they design their games. And these games are designed with, you know, very specific intent in mind. Um, I think, yeah, this is something that they definitely have caved into on consumer demand. But, you know, it's a pretty good concession. I think most yeah. of us have agreed that it's been a good it's been a good move on their part. Yeah. Also, I've seen a lot of people be really pissed about the fact that they're charging for cloud save backups. I just want to remind everybody that Sony and Microsoft does too. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, yeah. and it's even more expensive there. And yes, like a lot of people say that, yeah, on the other platforms, you can't back up your saves with the, on a USB drive and you can't on Switch. But yeah, yeah. Um, like, let's, I would just like to remind honest, people you're going to pay yeah. for this anyway. <laughs> I was just going to say, I just want to remind people, if people don't recall back in the PlayStation and PlayStation 2 days, you still had to buy memory cards yeah. to save stuff for your game. So this isn't a new thing. And, yeah. you know, you know, I it's always true. tell people to be wary of things that are free because there's always something you're paying in the end. Uh, and I think like using Facebook is a great example or mm -hmm. using uh, Gmail, you know, they, they can look at everything you do, but mm -hmm. it's free to an extent. Um, so yeah, it's not a huge concern. Plus, again, twenty dollars a year. If you think about it in terms of not going to Chipotle twice, I think you know people can definitely <laughs> swing and make sure that they don't go to Chipotle twice. Like it's yeah. not that big of an impediment on you. And if twenty dollars is really an issue for you, then maybe you probably shouldn't be buying a Switch. Yeah, exactly. Like if twenty dollars is a problem for you over a year, like we're talking about a year, and if and like if you if you have a bunch of friends, like you can get a family membership and bring down the cost even even more you know and if, yeah. if this is a problem then yeah like i don't know how you're playing games to begin with uh because games is not cheap <laughs> games are not cheap um uh, but yeah like i uh, i'm like generally positive about everything that's been hard here and a lot of people have said like a lot of people apparently expected uh that the paid online service would bring native voice chat voice chat to switch and not be done through an app anymore and i don't know where that came from because 
like why would they develop the app for it to be temporary like that seems like a lot of wasted resources like i very much exp like i don't think the smartphone app is necessarily the best choice but like that that is their choice they've chose to chosen to do, it, to do it through the smartphone app and like they would not develop they would have not have developed the app in the first place if it's going to be just a, uh just like um uh this uh, temporary thing that was until the paid service come out or yeah right like i'm not <laughs> like you know i'm, I'm not as concerned yeah i'm not concerned about that at all considering that i think most of the first party chat services are absolute hot trash because mm. i prefer to use discord for yeah, everything exactly. considering that you and i are both using discord to record this conversation mm or you know on this to have yeah. this conversation yeah. yeah like there's other third-party applications that you could use that are going to definitely enhance your experience and i don't doubt that that's probably going to be uh, i would bet more than 50 percent of the people who decide to game and play with each other i mean mm. there's definitely going to be people who try to use the chat services but i'm yeah i'm not i'm not super concerned mainly because i'm not going to be one of those users like i'm yeah. probably not going to use it yeah exactly uh, but yeah that is uh pretty much it for this new story i think and well since a lot of people were expecting an announcement for virtual console along with the online service which i thought was pretty weird to begin with like why did you think that the online service would bring an announcement for virtual console a bunch of games that don't have internet <laughs> like well, i think they were looking at it for sense, the, really? being able to well i think people saw it kind of saw it as if virtual console comes it would come in tandem with the announcement of Nintendo Switch Online because with an online infrastructure, then people could download games. Mm. I think that was a pretty logical uh, uh, conclusion. But yeah, but yeah, you can st you can reason. buy games on the eShop now. Yeah, well, I think they were hoping for something like yeah. a la carte, similar to like Xbox Live. You know? Yeah. <laughs> the um, store. So anyway, yeah. So uh, Kotaku talked to. Uh, Nintendo and a represent representative of Nintendo uh, said that yeah, Virtual Console doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but yeah, this is very this is very specific about the Virtual Console, the name of Virtual Console. This does not mean that classic games will not be available in the eShop. Um, and what I think this and this is where we go into speculation. I very much think that. This means that instead of Super Mario, uh, Super Mar the original, no, the original Super Mario Bros. is in that uh, Netflix <laughs> service. Um, but for example, let's say uh, Super Mario 64, right? Like, I, I, I think when it comes to this um, service that uh, comes with the uh, yearly subscription, I think we will see Nintendo uh, NES games and probably SNES games. I don't think we'll see an Nintendo 64. I don't think we'll see GameCube uh, or Game Boy Advance. Like, I think those games are too new to be given away for essentially for free. Yeah. And so I, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm just gonna finish this up. So, uh, if we see Super Mario 64 on Switch instead of it being Virtual Console Super Mario 64, it will just be Super Mario 64. Yeah. Um, and I think this makes the most sense for them because one of the big fears anytime you're a developer is that if you have such an extensive catalog of games that people want to play if you release them then that's somehow going to affect future sales and i think the way that they can kind of hedge their bet on this is by making these games only available by using their subscription and that way they're still reaping some sort of monetary benefit from people playing these games but not in any sort of outward way that would somehow negatively affect their sales of their current generation games so it makes sense it's kind of sad uh, because it's not the most gamer friendly in the sense that people who just want to play those games and have like ownership of that game on a new console won't be able to. And that's not to say that there won't be specific individual games that somehow get re-released. But I think the lion's share of games that are going to be coming that would have been virtual console, uh, like standalone games that you could buy piecemeal, um, you're just going to see them become a part of this network in the same way that... Uh, there are games on Xbox's Games for Gold that you can get for free every month as long as you have an Xbox uh, Gold membership. And as soon as you 
um, expire that membership, then you automatically lose access to all of the games that you got with your gold subscription. So that's it's probably um, going to be similar to that, I think. That's actually just true when it comes to PlayStation Plus. Uh, with games with gold, you actually get to keep the games after your subscription. Oh, because I recently invalidated my subscription because I wasn't playing anymore. And then my girlfriend wanted to play with me on, uh, what was it? Um, uh, the Division. Mm. Yeah. She wanted to play with me on The Division. And I didn't have access to any of my games that I had gotten through the Xbox Gold mm. uh, program. They it's were saying like I needed to. It's possible that's changed since. Well, but... it, it, was, it was telling me that I needed to reconnect with my Gold subscription to have yeah. access to those games because it wasn't letting me play them. So, yeah, that's, that's more of just an anecdote from my part. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of what I'm expecting to see from this. And again, I'm not holding it against them. I, so like all these games that people say they want to be able to play again, this is why I advocate for anybody listening. Do not sell your old hardware. I still have every single system I've ever owned and I don't mm. plan on ever selling them because I know at some point in time, I'm always going to get an itch to play one of those games and I could just go back and play them. Mm. So there you go. Yeah, um, and also just like related uh, when it comes to uh, like uh, one of the most um, uh, anticipated things when it comes to uh, Switch has been like a GameCube virtual console, right? Like that's what everyone talks about all the time. We can finally, yeah. we finally have a system or even back on the Wii U, we finally have a system that is powerful enough to uh, emulate GameCube. And uh, it was, I think this was Ash Paulson at the Game Explain who said, said this, and I, and I, like, it makes so much sense, which is, like, if you, if you think about GameCube, right, like, what are the games that, bra that are brought up in your mind? Like, it's Wind Waker yeah, and uh, Twilight Princess, Melee, um, Super Mario Sunshine, um, Mario Kart Double Dash, like, it's those games, right? And Wind Waker and Twilight Princess, they have already received HD remasters, which are better than the original games. So they are more likely to be ported to Switch from Wii U than uh, them being uh, emulated on uh, as a GameCube game, right? Yeah. Melee is not coming because that would totally cannibalize the sales of Smash 5. Exactly. Uh, so what do you have left? You have sunshine you have uh mario kart double dash and you have like a bunch of sports games which they seem to be going back to mario sports so i would i don't see them bringing back any gamecube mario sports so like a lot of the gamecube games like i don't think it's worth it for them to create a gamecube emulator for, for one or two games for yeah. yeah for just like a handful of games so i do well, think like already if we're seeing Sunshine on Switch, like that's going to be a remaster. You're forgetting one of the seminal GameCube games that they already announced that they're remaking for the 3DS, but could you guess what um, I'm Yeah, Luigi's of? Mansion, right. Yeah, there you go. That's um, I was going to say. My, exactly. Uh, and, and when yeah, it comes so to Luigi's Mansion, Mansion, that's already been Melee. remade for 3DS. Yes. And then one that never gets a lot of love because the third party on Nintendo never got a lot of love. But for me on GameCube, I don't know if you ever played 007 Nightfire, but nope. one of the greatest shooters hmm. that was on that uh, platform ever. Like, I love that game. But um, I don't know if you ever No, I have not played it. Um, <laughs> and yeah, like, you should, when you it... go back and play them. <laughs> and uh, also, like, when it comes to a lot of uh, notable GameCube games, like, it's a bunch of third party games. And with, with, when, with virtual, virtual console gone, like, that means that if a third party like Sega or Capcom or whoever wants their game on Switch, that's up to them now. Like, Nintendo is not going to port those games to Switch anymore, like they did back on the Wii. Um, so, so yeah, like, this, uh, all the third-party games are just up to, up to everyone else. And we're seeing them do that with, uh, like, Capcom is doing, like, Mega Man Legacy Collection and uh, Street Fighter 30th, 30th Anniversary Collection. Sega is doing their Sega Ages thing, so um, yeah, like GameCube is not. I don't think it's worth it for them to put a bunch of um, R and D into creating um, a GameCube emulator. Yeah, I agree. And then there's also companies out there like Iron Galaxy in Chicago that um, 
are basically studios solely created and developed to making ports for games. Mm. So like, I don't think that there's ever going to be a need for them to go back and create some sort of um, uh, emulator for that. Plus, you know, there have already been so many different people online who have made emulations for different games that you could play on. Uh, yeah. But yeah, so it, it's kind of a tandem of them not wanting to self cannibalize on their newer iterations of these IPs and uh, somehow getting money back uh, from people through this uh, online service that they'd have to pay a monthly fee for. So like, you know, it's, it's kind of sad again, not gamer friendly, but I totally understand Nintendo's decision to go this way. Uh, and also like the other games that would uh, be able to run on the same emulator because they have essentially the same hardware would be Wii games. But when it comes to Wii games, like you need the, the Wii remote to have a fully, um, you need those like Wii, Wii accessories to have a fully, authentic experience and nintendo would not like let's be honest like they would not uh put like a a wii game on switch and have it not be 100 percent accurate to the original experience yeah they would instead create they would probably remaster it recreate uh the like they would take that game and they would repurpose it repurpose its mechanics so it would work 100 percent perfectly on switch and that is kind of the, um, that is the, um, what happens when you, when you create like a gimme key system, if you want to call it that. So you can't, yeah. it, the experience can't be 100% recreated on other platforms. Like I, I played a uh, Super Mario Galaxy again on the Dolphin emulator and I played it with an Xbox One controller and I m mapped like the, um, the um uh the like the on screen like marker the ir um cursor to the right stick and like it's like to so like it's super janky like it's it's on the screen all the time and i'm moving it around with the analog stick and because it, i have to use the analog stick like i can't use a to jump all the time so i mapped uh rb to jump as well and in some sections where you have to use the uh, the Wii remote like aimed up straight and like balance it. Like I have to go into dolphin settings and I have to change the the physical um, positioning of the Wii remote. Like there's so much jank. Like this is the kind of jank that Nintendo would never ever ever put in their in their games. So yeah, like there. Are... And and also just another thing like when it comes to GameCube emulation, like. Gave the GameCube has pressure sensitive or uh, or no the triggers have like two steps to them and the, the triggers on Switch only have one step to them so like that would also be like a not one hundred percent recreated experience so <laughs> another like Nintendo would never do that like when it comes to uh, emulating Super Nintendo for instance like that it's so easy to remap to a new controller um, because it's just a bunch of buttons right. But yeah, so I don't think uh, GameCube is coming to Switch. It will, or Wii U is coming to Switch. Um, it will just be a bunch of ports, and uh, yeah, uh, and so yeah, and that ports... will also give Nintendo the opportunity to resell those games at full price. So I mean, yeah, <laughs> there's no uh, there are benefits all around for them. Yeah, and um, of that the death of the virtual console, what games do you think are going to be like the first ones? If you can predict any, do you think you're going to be coming to, uh, uh, to being ported from like um, their classic libraries? Yeah. So the, the, the games that will be emulated on switch is like Nintendo 64 games and uh, game boy advanced games. And, uh, I think, really? okay. um, and also DS, uh, I could also see them do DS on yeah. switch. Yeah, and kind of going off your previous like comments, I think the games that are most likely to be ported over are the ones that don't require specific jank controller schemas, right. like the same way you were saying with uh, being playing on the Dolphin Simulator. Mm. Um, like they, they have to be, they they have to be able to map correctly to current gen standards yeah. and not require a jank like you would in the Wii remotes or uh, in you know certain mapping that are only unique to Nintendo controllers mm. so i think those are probably gonna be the best options for any sort of ports and also like i saw someone mock up a very cool uh concept for the switch like if you want to play ds games on the switch right like you just uh rotate it vertically and then they could make some special 
um, accessory for it, so you can actually attach the Joy Cons to the side of the system. Yeah, and, and then we know you can Nintendo actually... loves accessories. <laughs> yeah, so then you would be able to play DS games on your Switch, and that would be sweet, right? Yeah, it would be. Um, but yeah, and it, uh, we still don't know if the Super Nintendo games will be in their online service or if they will be sold piecemeal. So. Uh, that could also be a game, uh, a bunch of games that could be sold piecemeal. And we also don't know about Game Boy games. Um, yep. But yeah, I, I do think is Nintendo 64 and Game Boy Advance and DS, those will... I could... <laughs> I probably was like 99% sure that those games will not be included in the online service and they will be sold piecemeal. Yeah, and I think, you know, my hope is I feel like the Game Boy never got the love it deserved. Uh, and a lot of my early seminal gaming moments came from the Game Boy and Game Boy Color, so I hope that they somehow get involved into this because uh, I think they deserve more uh, critical praise and attention from people. So uh, we'll see where that goes. Yeah, uh, and also like there are there have been so so many rumors about Mother Three coming to Switch that I oh, think yeah I've heard about that <laughs> uh, that and yeah like there were a lot of substantial rumors at the end of the Wii U's life uh, lifespan and I. My theory is that they were planning to put Mother 3 on Wii U, but at the end of it, they kind of realized, like, oh, we should probably hold it for Switch. <laughs> yeah. And wouldn't that be a great uh, a game to come out and be announced within the next year for, uh, for the Switch? I think that would be uh, pretty good fan service for Nintendo fans mm. who are, like, kind of the hardest of the hardcore, and, uh, you know, it might not do well commercially but it'll definitely do well critically and it yeah. might do well commercially but it's been a while yeah exactly and especially since they they brought earthbound back uh and earthbound like they they launched it in europe for the first time on wii u um earthbound beginnings like that was never released out of sight of japan and they did release that in in uh, north america and japan for the or and in and europe for the first time so like i could definitely see them do mother three um the the problem with mother 3 is that that one they would have to um localize it entirely from the beginning uh which is like really the only uh roadblock for that one but i definitely could see them do that because a lot yeah, of well, people there's... is asking for mother 3 yeah i don't think lqa should be an issue for them they could definitely get localization and there are plenty of people that i know online that would be willing to cut off both of their legs to do lqa for a mother three so <laughs> yeah like i don't think that that's going to be concerned at all for them yeah um so yeah i uh I, and, and, and like what a headliner game for game boy advance uh games for on switch right like yeah, i i could i could see them like announcing nintendo 64 game boy advance and ds and they probably have like super mario 64 uh mother three and uh what's a ds game that is like Nintendogs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean Nintendogs that would be fucking perfect on Switch. Um Yeah, that was that was such a weird game. Uh I think it's still like one of the top five highest grossing games of all time on the DS. I, I it still surprises me how they have not put a Nintendogs on, on mobile yet. Yeah, who knows? I don't I don't think anybody has a want for ever playing any sort of Nintendo game again, but you know. I, I mean, people. it would be great because Nostalgia. one of the one of the aspects of Nintendogs was to go out and walk with your dog, and that's like the Pokemon Go aspect. Like you can take your dog and walk it on the street. <laughs> yeah, literally. Yeah, I mean, uh, it would be so perfect on mobile. I'm sure that that yeah, I'm sure somebody somewhere in the bowels of Nintendo has thought about that, but I'm mm. pretty sure that that project got canned in favor of mm. hopefully the Mother Threes of the world. Yeah, and also like I mean. Pokemon Snap would have been perfect on Wii U, but it didn't do that. Yeah. Like, you could have used your gamepad as an actual camera. Like, how awesome would that have been? Eh? Hey, but there's there's always hope that Nintendo will do right by that uh, game or franchise in the same way that Captain Toad is coming to the Switch. So, you know, they're, they're saving a franchise that got, <laughs> you know, stuck on and marooned on uh, Wii U Island. Mm. Yeah. But yeah, that is... Uh, I think that is pretty much it for this episode. Uh, an hour, uh, an hour and a half. Pretty, pretty good episode. Yeah, pretty substantial. Yeah. Um. So thanks for watch. Uh, thanks for watching slash listening, depending on where where you're consuming this. Um. So where can people find you at? 
Uh, you could find me mainly on Twitter at Ready Edgemont. Uh, and sometimes I stream on Twitch with the same name, but not very often. Uh, and uh, if you want to game with me on Steam, you could also find me at Ready Edgemont. But uh, other than that, uh, yeah, I think, I think that's about it. Uh, thanks for having me on the show, Dennis. Yeah. Um, so you can find me at Dennis underscore Lofgren on Twitter and Instagram. You can follow the channel at Rebreak Radio on Twitter. Uh, and the, yeah, so we now have a short, a custom URL for the channel. It's youtube.com slash Rebreak. Finally, thanks everybody for letting me uh, pass 100 subscribers so I could actually uh, get that, um, uh, that custom URL. So let's hope we can uh, keep growing. And also, I'm trying to uh, start streaming more uh, regularly now as well. I think I'm gonna do a stream. Uh, it's gonna there's gonna be a stream sometime this week. Um, so yeah, that's gonna be exciting. Um, and um, yeah, subscribe, like the video, share it with your friends, and all that stuff. And we'll see you again next week. Have a good day, everybody.